And um, just want to welcome everyone here today. Um, for good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is for you. I uh, just want to thank you for joining in with iMoot. And um, in this session, we have Joshua Bragg uh, presenting about making homework work with Moodle. And I uh, just want to thank Joshua for giving up his time. Uh, it's the second time I think he's done this presentation. Um, and uh, just really appreciate you you're handing over your time, Joshua. I heard some really good reports from the first one, so looking forward to seeing it this time. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Um, I really, um, I really hope that you guys will uh, pop a lot of stuff in the chat. Um, make sure to give me your give me your thoughts as we're going through this. Um, so I'm a I'm a high school chemistry teacher in the United States. Um, I teach uh, mostly sophomores and juniors, uh, so mostly uh, 15 to 17 year olds. Um, and I actually started with Moodle uh, about six years ago as a result of <clears throat> uh, looking at my homework and the kind of situation with my homework and realizing that it just quite frankly wasn't working. Um, <clears throat> and came across Moodle and started realizing what I could do with some of the quizzes in Moodle, fix that. Um, let me, before we get too far into kind of how I've set things up, let me just give you a bit of my thoughts on kind of why I use homework and, and what the research that I've seen and, and why I do things the way that I do. Um, and a lot of this is is quite honestly very informed by my chemistry background, I, um, one of the things that as a, as a chemist you get um, very good at very quickly is, is naming compounds and figuring out formulas for things. Um, so much to the point that when I finally started teaching after, you know, four years at the university, um, I, had a really hard time teaching that simply because it was so automatic that I didn't even think about it anymore. But it's one of those things that has to be so automatic because if you're constantly looking up the name of something or fit, trying to figure out what the formula of something is, you'd lose your mind. Um, and so what we really want for students to be able to do complicated things is for them to be able to get entirely automatic with all of the simple parts that come before it. Um, one of the most useful groups of research that I've seen in my teaching career is the research on cognitive load theory. Um, and what that would basically suggest is that if you um, are spending a lot of time and energy trying to, say, figure out the formula of a compound, you don't have any brain capacity left over to do the more complicated things later that you need to do with it. And so I see practice as essential to building that automaticity, to building how quickly we can do the simple little things that we need to do to move on to more complicated things. And eventually that's of course where we want to get students to. We have to do some of that um, memorization quite frankly sometimes and, um, and also just very simple practice. Um, we think about this kind of in terms of, of math for just a second. If you um, know that, uh, if you know that, uh, if you don't know that five times six is, is 30, then it's going to be very difficult for you in an algebra class to realize that five times six X would be 30 X. Without that little, without that little piece of information there being entirely automatic, you can't see the connection there. It doesn't become obvious to you and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out that little piece of the puzzle while really you should be busy solving that equation. And so the problem that I was having with my students was that they were, quite frankly, taking the homework rather unseriously. They didn't see the potential for them to build uh, this sort of automatic uh, nature of things. And so it, by the end of the class, it was particularly catching up to them. They were still struggling with some of the things early on. 
And so what I've kind of devised here is a system of uh, quizzes essentially in Moodle, although they function very differently from some typical quizzes that you might see, um, at, that are designed to basically be their homework. So I've got a couple different purposes that I'm serving with these sorts of things. Um, the, the, here's, here's kind of the, um, the purposes that I'm serving and then the term that I use uh, with my students to make clear what to them what I'm looking for. So the first is just kind of some generic practice. Uh, these are your typical homework problems that you might be assigned. Um, for kind of any sort of class where you need practice on sorts of things. Um, if I call it homework with my students, then they kind of understand to a certain point what we're trying to get to. Um, I've actually sort of, to a certain extent, started switching over to just calling it practice with them, um, but still the, the idea of homework is makes it a little bit clearer to them. The next piece is um, kind of a measurement to a certain extent of how automatic they have become with these things. One of the kind of hallmarks of being automatic with something is that you should be able to do it faster than you were when you were not automatic with it. And so I used a set of time practices, which I call quizzes for my students, to help the students gauge how automatic they are with that material. I time those fairly closely so that if you know what you're doing, have plenty of time to get it done, it's no problem. If you're sitting there trying to figure out how you're doing it along the way, then you might run out of time or might be pushing the time really close. The other piece of this is, so I, I call them quizzes, quite frankly, because students tend to take them just a touch more seriously if you call it a quiz. Uh, they can you know, not get it, figure out how to do a homework problem all day long, and then you stick a quiz in front of them at, that they don't know how to do, and suddenly they panic just a little bit um, and realize, oh my goodness, I probably actually ought to know how to do this. Um, it's an amusing little, it's an amusing little effect, even though the, the homework and the quizzes are essentially the exact same weight in their grade um, in terms of the overall numbers of each one and the percentages of each little part. Um, and so I, um, it, it's a, it's an amusing little, uh, it's an amusing little effect that I'm quite happy to take advantage of. Um, the next two pieces are, um, the next two pieces are kind of two components of a final test review um, to get them to make sure that they're ready for the test. Uh, it comes in kind of two parts. The first is a, a bit of multiple choice. Um, multiple choice for my students is, is one of the things that they, quite frankly, frequently complain about. Um, if you write really, really good multiple choice questions, you have to really understand the material to work your way through them. I'm not talking about writing trick questions, but making sure that the the wrong answer choices in particular represent really common mistakes or common misunderstandings that students can have. And if you're taking the time to write really good multiple choice questions like that, then students to a certain extent begin to fear them just a little bit because they realize they can't kind of bluff their way through them. And so one of the things that they would constantly ask me for is, can I get some more multiple choice problems to review? I know you're going to write some good ones. Um, so I've, I've got a, a decent group of them now, which I call the, um, the multiple choice review for them. Whereas what I'm really trying to get at with that is more of the concepts behind things. Chemistry tends to revolve a lot of around practice problems and uh, problems that have to be solved. But using the multiple choice actually lets me get more at the the concepts behind things without having to read and grade essay questions. Um, makes it a quite a quite a bit more more expedient and a little bit more uh, practical for the students to get decent feedback quickly. And then the other piece of this is just some problem type practice uh, that they've got so far. So before I move on, does anybody have any any questions or any thoughts that they'd like to share?
right? Well, feel free to pop them in the text box. I'm, uh, I'll try to make sure that I'm paying attention to it along the way. Um, so I'm just gonna walk you through how I set up each of these uh, little pieces of this and um, how all of them work in terms of the Moodle quizzes themselves. So the first piece is just that practice set, uh, the homework that they have. Yeah, Shane, that's a, it, it's a really, I think that's really fairly important too. Um, it, it focuses them on what they're supposed to be doing. Um, having it, one of the things that I say very frequently to students is um, kind of elaborating on the purpose of the quizzes to make sure that they're clear on why they have that time limit on there. Um, because they often, they often don't like the time limit because they have to really kind of know what they're doing. Um, and so that, it, having kind of elaborating on all that uh, to a certain extent is really helpful for them. The so the going back to the practice piece here, these are um, it's, a, it's actually a set of common questions that I give to every student. Um, they've all got the same questions, um, so that when they get stuck, um, they can help each other and. Um, it also makes it quite a bit easier to write some decent feedback on it that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, they are graded and, um, and basically graded for how correctly they get them. Um, the, they have an unlimited number of attempts and I use the uh, particular behavior, uh, question behavior in Moodle intentionally with this so that they have as many tries as they want to be able to figure things out. Um, my behavior of choice for this um, homework system is what's known as adaptive mode with no penalties. Um, so if you've never looked at all of the different options for question behaviors on Moodle quizzes, you really ought to take the time to. There's some really interesting tweaks that you can do to things. Um, adaptive mode, no penalties is, is the one that I use for all of their homework. Um, the way this works is you'll see that there's a little check button that's on each of these questions and they can type in their answer and hit check and it will give them, um, it will grade it for them immediately and then also give them some feedback uh, that you can put in on how well they're doing. Then they can change their answer and hit check again and see if they've gotten it right this time. And so essentially they can sit there with this one problem and check it over and over and over again until they get it right. In terms of practice, that's what I want. I, I don't expect them necessarily to get it right the first time or maybe even the second time or the third time, but I do expect them to be able to figure out how to do it eventually. They need to take the time to figure out how to do it so that they can um, be clear on what's going on. These are very short homework assignments typically. Um, I'm typically doing something less than five questions. Um, maybe five questions uh, is, um, Five questions is probably more, uh, five or four, four or five questions is probably the rule here. Um, one of the most important pieces in this though, is that you have to write good feedback for the students on what they're doing wrong. So if we take a look at this question here for just a second, um, this is the, this is the same question over and over again. Um, and this is one of the kind of the earliest questions that I have in my class on teaching students how to convert from one set of units to another. And so the, the first bit here is just showing what it looks like when it's right. The, the next bit here you'll notice is practically the same answer, but um, just slightly off of that. So there's this concept in chemistry called sig figs, um, which if you don't know what that is, then count yourself lucky because it's mostly just a pain. Um, kind of necessary though to a certain extent. And so this is um, this is a mostly right answer. They just made a simple rounding error essentially. Um, and so that is part of the feedback here on what they're doing. Here's a um, here's a, a an answer though where a student got this entirely wrong. Um, if you take a look at that it's it's probably obvious to you uh, what they did wrong. Uh, rather than dividing the 9,100 seconds um, by 60 twice, they actually multiplied the 9,100 seconds by 60 
twice. And so they get an entirely ridiculous number of hours. And if you're thinking about that at all, then you don't even, when you get that answer, you don't type that in because you know that can't possibly be right. There are certainly not that many hours in 9,100 seconds. But that being said, it's one of those that gets typed in rather frequently on this particular assignment. And so I wanted to make sure that there is feedback for the students in when they type in this answer so that they can realize that this really doesn't make any sense. And so my idea here with the feedback to a certain extent is I'm not necessarily giving them the answer of how to do it, but I'm kind of leading them in the direction of where they need to go. Um, and, and seeing, of course, that that doesn't make sense and giving them a sense um, of how they can self-process things a little bit later on is useful as well. All right, again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, pop them in the chat, um, but I'm going to keep going and work through the next, um, the next group of of assignments that I have, and those are the quizzes. So again, this is designed to be timed feedback. And so here we've actually got another question on sig figs. Uh, you can see that this quiz has a t grand total of three questions on it. I believe for this particular quiz, they actually have two minutes to do the quiz. Um, this is something that requires uh, absolutely no calculations. Um, basically, look at the number and figure out how many sig figs it has, and then type in an answer and move on. It's designed to be short this way so that they don't have time to sit there and puzzle over their notes and figure things out. I'm really, again, testing if they've really made this automatic in their head. For these quizzes, to try to set them apart a little bit, um, I use uh, deferred feedback behavior for this. So quite frankly, it would be a bit maddening to my students if they were taking a very short timed quiz with the, the check button built in. They get an answer for the first one and hit the check button and see that it's wrong and then have to very quickly scramble to try to figure out um, what they did wrong and then being very worried about having the rest of the time. Um, that would be an, uh, that would be quite a quite frankly, very worrying to them. Besides, I'm also trying to at least mimic a little bit of what they're going to see on the test in terms of not getting back what, not having the check button, the, the lovely Moodle check button uh, to see how they're doing um, on, my, on my paper test. And so I should mention that I'm, um, my class is uh, a face-to-face -face class, really. Um, and then I use Moodle to kind of supplement my class and set things up. Um, with some videos and, and all sorts of other things that that help them out along the way but uh, my class is predominantly a face-to-face -face class and so they take all their tests in class on paper where i can proctor them and be absolutely certain of what's going on and so i want this quiz to be at least a little bit more of a sense of kind of where they're going with this these are all random questions that um that pull from a, a decently large bank, uh, students to kind of encourage them to take them a bit more seriously, they only have two attempts on each one of these. Um, and so they're, they're more or less usually always going to get the different questions um, the second time around. In fact, uh, thankfully, uh, Tim Hunt has fixed a, a, a long-standing feature request in the um, Moodle quiz system. And so now when I upgrade to 2.9 over the summer, they will always get new questions on each different attempt. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. All right. Um, again, if you if you have any questions or any thoughts, please feel free to pop them in the chat as we as we go along here. Yeah, Andy, I was I was very, very thankful uh, when I heard about that. Um, yeah, Tim is pretty much awesome. I told him in a session yesterday that um, th that he was a rock star and he kind of demurred a little bit, but uh, he, he really is. Um, the work that he's done on the quiz is in the six years that I've been around is amazing. And I'm very thankful that he's around working on it. All right, this next part is the multiple choice um, part that that I was mentioning earlier. So one of the, this is, these sorts of quizzes are quite a bit different. This is designed to be kind of final test review, making sure that they understand the concepts. And so I've got a, 
These are, these are all multiple choice questions, and here's the sort of question that we have. And you'll notice that this has a little bit of a different look to it from the, the typical multiple choice question you have. So the first part looks completely normal. And then down here at the bottom, we've got this new little bit down here. So this is what's known as certainty-based marking. And if you've never taken the time to look at certainty-based marking in the Moodle quiz system, you really should. It's, it's an incredibly... Um, it's an incredibly useful system, although it is a bit odd at first and it takes kind of some getting used to. Once you understand the design of it and why it's done the way that it's done, then it's easy to see how you make it useful. So the basic idea here is that students will first answer the question and, and figure out which one of these answers is correct. And then they rate how sure they are about that answer. Depending on whether they get the question right and how sure they say they are about the answer, that's what determines their grade for that particular question. And so what we want here is students, the ideal scenario is students who know the correct answer and are very sure that they know the correct answer. One of the things that we really don't want is for students to be absolutely sure that they have the correct answer, but instead be completely wrong. We don't also don't want students to be very underconfident of how much they know either. And so the grading system here rewards knowing stuff in the first place, and then also being aware of how well you know the things that you know. So, for example, if you answer this question correctly and check that you are quite sure of the answer and check it, get it right, then the certainty-based marking scheme will give you three points out of one point for that particular question on the quiz. And so it is possible if you were taking an entire quiz and you got every question right and said you were entirely sure on each one of them that your final grade for that quiz would be a 300 out of 100. Now there is a flip side to this to make that make sure that that really doesn't ever happen uh, like that. The flip side of this is if you say if you answer this question and mark that you are quite sure of it but then get it wrong the question will grade it so that you get a negative six points out of one point. So again, it's possible in the extreme case of someone getting every answer wrong but being very sure of uh, how this works, uh, being very sure that they had it right, uh, that they would get a negative 600 out of 100 in the grade. Hey Mary, thanks for putting that in the uh, putting that in the chat for me. The other very nice piece of this is that you've um, once you're done with the quiz, you also see this nice little report up at the top. And I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember off the top of my head if this is part of a uh, reporting plugin that is also really useful. That's mentioned in the docs over there that you should install with this. Um, um, and basically, it's it will give you a report of kind of how well you did in each uncertainty level that you put and give you a sense of whether you're overconfident to a certain extent on some things or if you're underconfident on other things. Uh, and so you can see the student's grade here ends up being a 72 out of 100. Um, really, they got somewhere in the neighborhood of about a 58.7. Um, in terms of their accuracy on the uh, on the quiz itself, uh, but because they were reasonably good at assigning where their certainty was, then you can um, then they get a, a bit of a bonus on their grade as a result of that. Yeah, Mary, this is one of the one of the biggest problems that with multiple choice questions is just that some of them are just so poorly written that you can know absolutely nothing about the subject and guess your way through things um i, I don't know quite frankly how we go to the go about fixing that to, other than some of the statistics which i'll show you guys later um but it's it, it takes quite a lot of time to get good multiple choice questions in there um 
And you can find out fairly quickly which ones are good and which ones are bad as long as you're taking the time to look at the statistics in Moodle. So because of the weirdness of the grades here, I have not instituted the grades from this as part of my course grade. Uh, there's, uh, quite frankly, it's, it's a battle that I'm not really willing to fight with students yet or with parents yet on why my child got a negative 200 on this quiz and why you're averaging that into their grade. Um, that would be a that would be a bit of a rough conversation. Um, the uh, I do give them an unlimited number of attempts, and so the idea um, the the idea here is that um, they could go back and do it again um, and and figure things out. Um, but it's still just not really a battle that I'm willing to fight. Yeah. So the guy who Mary, the guy who um, who's worked on this the most is, is uh, Tony Gardner Medwin and his um, so he is, works at a medical school I believe in California and they use this for all of their tests at the medical school because for doctors it's particularly important for you to be very sure about how well you know something or how well you don't know something so that you are um, giving patients care appropriately. Um, his the research that he's done has shown that uh, the best number to as a representation of how well the students know what's going on is actually this accuracy plus bonus um, bit. Uh, if he, I, I thought he was at for some reason I thought he was at UCLA in California, but you know maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on that. So um, I, don't, I, I quite frankly don't. I'm not I'm not confident at all on that answer. I'm going to uh, label that as a C not equal to number one here uh, for my answer. Um, but in any case, this this number is the um, this number is the one that is best reflective of how students are going to do on subsequent tests. And so uh, Tony's suggestion has been that we change how the numbers go into the grade book and make this accuracy plus bonus number the number that goes in the grade book. And that is a percentage that would be in between zero and 100. And so it would work out in terms of other things. Uh, the other suggestion um, that, that Tony has kind of made in the meantime is to make sure that you turn on the extra credit options in the grade book so that if a student does get a grade over 100, that they will see it um, as an actual grade over 100 in the grade book. All right, the next, um, the next piece and the last piece the, to talk about in terms of kind of the structure of this is the, the generic test review that I have. So these are practice problems that students are kind of expected to solve and work their way through. These are graded again, um, much like before, there's no time limit on these and they have an unlimited number of attempts. And also like before on the homework, these are diff the same questions for everyone um, for reasons that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the difference here is that I tend to use immediate feedback behavior for this. So the problem that I've, that I had at various points with the test review was that I would have students who would work their way through the test review and they would not really know what's going on. They'd sit there, um, work through things, eventually get an answer after, you know, 10 or 15 tries on it and hit the check button and it would pop up green and they'd say, oh goody, I figured it out and move on to the next question and do the same sort of thing on the next question. Um, and then they'd come in, take the test and be incredibly surprised that they didn't do well on the test because at the end of the day, what they really remembered was, oh, I figured them all out and they had forgotten that it taken them 15, 20 tries to figure out those questions along the way. And so I switched the behavior of those test reviews over to an immediate feedback. The difference on immediate feedback is there is a check button and you can check and see how you did and it will tell you immediately whether you've done it correctly or not and give you all the same feedback that it was before. <laughs> That's a good one, Andy. Um, 
And, but the difference is they can't then recheck it. They can't change their answer. They're done with it for that attempt. And so the only way that they have to go about improving their score is to take another attempt entirely on the quiz. The benefit of this is but with, that when they're finally done with that first attempt, they see a score. And they see a score that really represents how well they knew the material on the first try. And that is going to be a much better representation of how they're eventually going to do on that test in the next day or two than what their final grade is on this test review. Quite frankly, if you haven't practiced it enough to get it right on the first try or so, then you are really not ready for the test yet. And so my, my usual message to students here is if you're not if you're not happy with the grade that you got on your first try through the test review, then what that means is it's time for more practice. It's time for building that automaticity and make sure that when you take the test, you're going to be able to consistently do it. All right. One of the most important things in making this work uh, particularly in the practice assignments and then in the test review assignment is making sure that you've got quality feedback for the students so that they can get a sense of how they're doing things and whether they're doing things right and what they're doing wrong. This is one place where the, the Moodle quiz system makes it really easy to figure out those common mistakes and, and, and misunderstandings that students are having. For each question in a quiz, you can get statistics on how students are doing on that quiz, including a listing of all of the different answers that they have entered and how often they appeared in each of these different spots. And so this is from a practice assignment that my students do. Um, this is a list of all of the questions, all of the answers that don't match any of the feedback that I've already set up in the system. And so if we kind of look through this list here, you can see these ones that I've put in the green boxes here that are all sort of similar. And I'm going to slide this over. Unfortunately, this is not the greatest formatted um, image here, but you slide these over and these are, you know, reasonably common. So this is this one over here is 4% of all of the answers that were placed in. At this point, so you can see that there's some fairly common mistakes here. Um, so if uh, for to a chemistry teacher uh, looking at these uh, looking at these uh, numbers here and uh, thinking about the type of problem that this is, it's pretty obvious fairly quickly what the students have done wrong. In fact, the negative signs on some of these are a dead giveaway. Uh, it turns out that the mistake that these students are making is using a um, Celsius temperature when doing a calculation rather than a Kelvin temperature. Um, and so you can have a negative Celsius temperature, but there's no such thing as a negative Kelvin temperature. And so doing the calculations wrong, you can get to these answers. So what you do is you put these answers in to the questions themselves and you, you make them be marked wrong, but then you type in some feedback to say, you're, the mistake that you're making here is you're using Celsius temperatures instead of Kelvin temperatures. Gas laws are proportional to Kelvin temperatures, not to Celsius temperatures. And you can see that if we look at these numbers here for just a second, most of these, this will cover nearly all of the common mistakes that these that these students are making. There are a few others along the way, um, none of which I've been able to figure out as as what obviously happened there on each of these, but they're reasonably low incidence, and so it's probably just someone typing something in their calculator wrong along the way. Uh, you could chase your tail forever on this, but picking out the things that are most frequent and, and most common are the things that are going to get you the furthest, and so that's definitely worth your time there.
And there have been times where I have been, I've, I've sat there for a few minutes trying to figure out what the students have done wrong and have never figured it out. Um, and the best thing to do in that spot is put that answer in anyway in to get some feedback. And I write a little note saying, this is a fairly common wrong answer, but I'm not really sure how students are getting this. When you get this, when you see this feedback, please come see me and show me your work so that I can figure out what you're doing wrong. And then just go in and change it later um, and figure things out. The other piece with the design here is you want students to be able to actually accomplish the task on the homework. You don't want them spinning their wheels for hours and hours uh, figuring things out. And so one of the things that I make sure to do is I'm careful about how I'm building the homework practice the, itself. I want to make sure that the practice problems are building on, upon each other so that the, the hardest question, the most difficult or tricky question, is not the one that's first along the way. The first question in the homework set ought to be something that is as close to the examples that we have done in class as possible. And then as I work the way through the rest of the um, through the rest of the problems in that set, I'll add in a new little wrinkle for the second one, and then maybe another new little wrinkle for the third, and then even possibly another new little wrinkle for the fourth. Although sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I give them a, a little bit easier one on the fourth one, just to give them a, a little bit of a confidence boost on the way back out of the through the through the sit section. So you can see the effects of all of this in the question statistic and the quiz statistics on Moodle. This is a, a graph that um, is shown for each quiz, um, basically how the, the red bar is what's known as the facility index, which is basically how easy the question is. Um, it's more or less how often students got it right. It's a bit complicated because you've got extra attempts in there, but more or less, that's the idea there. Um, and so you can see on this quiz that it starts off reasonably easy and they're getting 90% of it right the first time and then moving on down. And this one is now somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% along the way. Um, and so this is, this is working out well from my view. And even though students are mostly getting these problems right, this is still important for practice. Um, they still need to practice and make sure that they're doing things right so that they are consistently doing things right later on the test. I remember very vividly from um, my time in high school in, in a pre-calculus class uh, learning some um, – uh, thanks, Barry. Um, you, I realize you're, an, you're a language teacher, if I remember right, um, but the math is – is um, the math is uh, uh, the math is one of those things that it it really just takes practice, um, and unfortunately you self select it out of the practice. Um, but that's not a it's one of those things that practice is is really what it boils down to. In any case, um, the I remember very vividly from a, a pre calculus class um, that I. There was a there was an entire unit on um, on trig identities that I remember very clearly that I did not do anywhere close to the amount of homework that I should. I understood it perfectly in class, and you sat me down in class with all of the things that I was supposed to be doing, and I could always figure out how to do it. But because I could always figure out how to do it, I didn't really do any of the practice stuff that I needed to at home. And that test um, was a test that I failed rather miserably because when I got in to do the um, when I got in to do the test, I could do some of them, but I did not, I did not figure out how to do all of them. And that, and you couple it with that, I didn't take the time to memorize all of the identities that I should have memorized along the way. And because I hadn't been practicing them, I hadn't uh, memorized them along the way either. Um, it really messed me up quite, quite bad on that. In any case, practice is one of those things that we just kind of have to get done along the way to make sure that we're there. The other thing that I keep a close eye on is how long it's taking my students to do these practice assignments. And so this is not a, an all-inclusive set of all of my students' um, times on a particular assignment this year, but this is a, a reasonably rep representative sample of what I've seen before. 
and there's a very big spread in this in terms of what you see there. So going from you know an hour and 19 minutes uh, to one minute and 50 seconds. And so this is a this is a this is timings from a uh, four question practice assignment um, that students had. And I'm not so much interested in the in the outliers to a certain extent. We can we can explain away the outliers. Um, yeah, Andy, this is um, this is actually built into the the quiz re, the quiz results panel. You can see in the quiz grades themselves um, how long they took on each individual um, attempt along the way. You can actually, if you go into the attempt itself, you can see when they what time they submitted each individual question along the way too. So if I were to go into this one hour and nineteen minute. Um, quiz, I could see, well, were they working on it solid for an hour and 19 minutes? Were they checking answers all along the way through that hour and 19 minutes? Or did 10 minutes in, they go make themselves a sandwich and then get distracted and then come back 20 minutes later and then continue working on the quiz? No, it's, it's built straight into the, um, it's built straight into the normal quiz reporting system. Um, so, in my mind here, when I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm kind of noticing a, a few things. I'm seeing first that, in general, this is taking somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 to 40 minutes to finish this assignment. And that's not a that's not an unreasonable proposition from my mind uh, to see things here. Um, I'd like it to be shorter than that. And certainly, the you can see evidence of people who have it better under control who are doing it much shorter. Then I'm also looking at the... Um, the other end of the spectrum and looking at the long quiz times to see who's there, but also looking at this really, really short one. Um, and so I can tell you uh, when, from when I pulled this particular group of, um, this particular group of data here, that that particular time there is a student who is very diligent about working out um, all of the problems ahead of time. I actually give the students all the problems on a paper copy that I give them uh, so that whenever they um, are stuck in some other class or they are with nothing to do or they are stuck in uh, on a bus ride to an athletic event with nothing to do that they can pull it out and work through stuff and save themselves a bit of time along the way. And so I can tell you that this particular student is one who's really diligent about not using Moodle at all until they're ready to check their answers and working out all of the problems on paper and then going in, starting the attempt, typing in all their answers, hitting check, making sure that they've gotten it right, and then moving on. And so really that one minute and 50 seconds really corresponds to how long it took them to type in all of their answers. So my idea here with all of this is I want to make sure that I'm getting a sense of how long it takes for the very good students to do this so that I can make sure that I'm setting my times on my quizzes appropriately. But then also I'm paying attention to the students on the, the higher end of the scale so that I can have a conversation with them about, you know, it really shouldn't be taking you an hour to do this, these four questions on this homework assignment here. If you're really sitting there beating your head against a wall trying to figure this out, then the correct way to do this is, is not to, to beat your head against the wall. It's to come in and ask me for some help. Let me see what you're doing so that I can give you some more targeted feedback on what you're doing wrong. If you're sitting there struggling with it because you're not, you're really unsure of what's going on, then this is a time for this is a time for some remediation for some new instruction again to make sure that you're set to go there. The, the other piece in terms of kind of the long-term understanding of what's going on um, is the idea of kind of space versus mass practice. So the practice that we do all together at once at the beginning of a, a, a section to make sure that we've got it, and then also how do we continue to practice things along the way so that we can make sure that we still remember things later. And so I imagine most of you have seen this sort of forgetting curve here, this showing you how much, um, how much of the material that you learn leaves your memory and is not really accessible and useful to you 
after a certain number of days. And then what happens if you review that material a day later and then review that material a day later again and review that material later? Eventually, the more often we use things, the more we retain them. Our brains work much better in terms of uh, our brains work much better in terms of how often we see things rather than how much time we spend on things. And so if we see things more often, then it'll help us remember things better. And so I actually designed my assignments and my class to help build this along the way. So this might be a kind of a typical pattern in my class. Um, we might, I might introduce a new topic in class on Monday, and then on Tuesday night, they might have a homework assignment that they're supposed to do on that assignment. On Wednesday night, they've got a second, more difficult homework assignment to practice with. And then I'm also throwing them a for kind of a first version, easier bit on the quiz, so that timed practice on that particular topic. And then on Thursday, I'll throw in a new quiz that's a little bit harder than the one before to, again, make sure that they're, um, that they're practicing along the way. And so what I've done is I've taken this one topic that we introduced this one day on Monday and then spread out the work over four different days. And so for now four different days, students have been working with this same topic along the way, practicing it and doing some homework and taking some quizzes on it. And so by the end of that, the idea here is that students have done things quite a few times and it helps them remember it better later on. They throw in the test review along the way. Um, thanks, Ali Reza. Um, so the idea here, you throw in the test review along the way and then and then finally the test and there's a whole um, long period of time where they're kind of working all along the same things. The tricky bit on all of this is that you then got to overlap some things along the way. Um, fortunately, chemistry is fairly conducive to this. Um, most of the things that we do are not discrete little individual topics, but are all very much interconnected. And so I may start with topic A, and then the next logical extension of that is B. Um, and it's very much related to A, but kind of another, uh, another little twist or step further on it. And so we might talk on that for a few days. And then I will... Um, give them another homework assignment on that on Thursday, and then on Friday they're picking up again the second homework assignment on that sort of thing. And this is kind of the, the process of my class as we go through things. The other, the other piece here that is really, really useful um, is the, the progress bar block. Um, if you have never used the, um, if you never used or seen the progress bar block, I would really, really suggest that you download it um, as soon as you can and try it out. It is amazing in terms of the, the results that you can get with it. Um, my students have been conditioned um, over all of their schooling years to love green checks along the way they expect to be doing well on things and they like it when they are doing well on things and having a bar that will slowly but surely fill up with a whole big pile of green checks is something that they are very happy about and the inverse of that is when they forget that one assignment along the way or uh, don't quite finish something along the way either, then they also have a, they end up with this red X that they see for the rest of that unit of the class. And it stares at them every time that they log into Moodle. And every time they see it, they say, oh my goodness, there's still that red X there. I have students that are very, always very interested at the end of a unit. When is the progress bar going to go away? When do I not have to look at that red X anymore? Um, and so they, uh, when I instituted the progress bar in my class, I went from roughly a 70% average homework turn in uh, completion rate to a 90% homework completion rate. Um, and I quite frankly attribute pretty much all of that to the progress bar. Um, there is something very powerful about being reminded every single time you log into Moodle whether or not you have done an assignment that you were supposed to do or not. Um, 
And so for a student who ends up down here at the bottom like this, it's very clear to them very quickly that they haven't done some of the things that they need to along the way. And so at, when we get to the end of the section, then they take a lot more time to make sure that they're doing things well there. The other kind of, yeah, it's it, the progress bar is is also the thing that my students always use to find where all of their assignments are. Um, they 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 love it. They keep track of things that with it that way. Um, the other piece to this is that I set the um, grade to pass on all of the practice assignments, um, the test review, uh, the the homework assignments, um, not the quizzes and not the multiple choice review, just because those are a bit tricky on this. But I set the grade to pass on those to be a 100, so that students, are, in my mind, students should be expected on all of the practice assignments to practice them until they get them right. And so they will get a red X um, when the homework assignment closes if they have not figured out every single little point on that particular homework assignment. The, the kind of flip side of this on the back end is that if a student is having trouble with it and they need to come in later um, and get some more help on it, I'll happily use a user override on it and open up the quiz for them again so that they can uh, finish it off and make sure that things are going um, things are going well there. In any case, love the progress bar. If you haven't, if you haven't installed it on your on your Moodle, you really, really need to. It's incredibly useful. So I mentioned um, I mentioned before that uh, that I give all of the same practice problems to students for both the test review and for the generic homework assignments. And part of the reason why I do that is because it, it, it makes it, quite frankly, easier to give feedback on all of those things, although that's still possible to do. It's still quite possible to do with the, um, the statistics report. It's just not quite as easy. But the more important reason in my mind is that I expect my students to, um, with, with the practice assignments, it's, it's practice. I don't expect them to know exactly what they're doing along the way, and I do expect them to ask for help. And so one of the things they can do is, of course, ask me for help, but I also give them a, um, a forum for each unit on Moodle where they can ask for help from their peers, and this is kind of my default preference for how they do this, this sort of process here, because um, it helps for other students to start explaining it to them. It gives them another person explaining it to them rather than me. Quite frankly, I've already explained it once to them. Me explaining it to them a second time is probably not the best task for them to do um, to get it figured out another way. Having a different student explain it to them or a different person explain it to them is probably a bit more helpful than me explaining it to them a second time. Um, just hearing it from a different person or a different way of, of presenting this. And so I have students who, you know, they struggle with a homework question and they post, I, you know, I, I don't know how to do this or, um, most this is, you know, here's here's the answer that I keep getting. Here's the work that I've tried to do along the way. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? What do I need to fix to make this so that I'm doing this correctly? And the students will respond to each other. I actually make this participation in this help forum a grade for them. They either have to post a question along the way or answer someone else's question along the way. Um, over the course of the unit to make sure that they understand what's going on. And yes, I actually do get students from time to time using the equation editor um, to type in their math um, in there. They're not real super keen on the equation editor because it's not incredibly user friendly, but it's 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 good enough that most of them will take the time to do it. And I do incentivize that a bit with their grade on how I grade their posts when they do it, or rather when they don't do it. Um, There are, of course, issues with all of this, and um, uh, the the biggest issue that I have with all of this at this point, um, kind of six years into tweaking this along the way, that I really don't have a, a solution for, and I'd love to hear if any of you guys have any thoughts on this, is uh, because the questions are on Moodle, and the students just have to type in an answer, there's a decent proportion of them 
that see this as an opportunity to do all of their work on their calculator and not bother to like write anything down or figure anything out. And then what invariably happens is they get the answer wrong. And because everything's in their calculator and nothing's written down, they have no way of going about figuring out what they're doing wrong. And so they come in to see me and say, you know, I was really working forever on this problem last night and I couldn't figure it out. And my immediate response was, well, let me see the work that you were doing on this. And they say, well, I was doing it all on my calculator. And at that point, I'm, I'm kind of done. I, I've got nothing that I can offer to them in, in terms of a way of figuring out what they've done wrong on all of those different attempts that they've made on that problem because they've got nothing written down. And so my only response is, well, I can't really do a whole lot for you. Why don't you write down some work now, work it out, and let me see what you're doing so that I can point it out. Um, if anybody's got a great suggestion on a way to encourage students to do that along the way, I would love to hear it. Um, I have something that's been going on now for uh, more and more over the past two years that I really don't have a good solution for other than training along the way when they do finally come into me. Um, it really in terms of and really quite frankly in terms of cognitive load theory there's a really valuable um, really valuable piece in terms of writing something down because writing it down and having it written out means that you don't have to focus and keep all of the little details of exactly how you're doing a particular problem in your head along the way. And so it makes it much more likely that they're going to get things right when they start writing it out because they're not missing the little details along the way. But students very frequently don't see it that way. Um, this is, I have uh, teaching chemistry, I have pretty bright kids, and they are very used to school being relatively easy for them. Um, chemistry tends to be one of those one of those first places where it's not so easy for them. So they have some rather bad habits along the way that they've developed that um, I work very hard to try to break out of them. The other kind of piece here is is just some. Um, That's a that's a that's a good one, Andy. Um, that's a that's a nice idea, um, and 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 quite frankly, my best students are are always the ones that they they write out their homework on a piece of paper like they were going to turn it into me anyway, um, because then they see they 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 end up working problems mostly correctly when they do it that way. The other. Um, the other piece of this is um, what, I, and I put cheating in quotation marks here um, intentionally because I don't really see this so much. Um, <laughs> uh, I, Andy, they're mine. You can't have them. Um, I like them quite a lot. Um, the uh, the cheating, I put cheating in quotation marks here is um, because I don't really see this so much as cheating uh, to a certain extent, um, but it it does it is sort of along those lines. So I have students because they all have the same homework problems and test review problems that will just ask each other for the answers to the questions and then just plug those in. We all know that at the end of the day, when the time comes from the, to take the test, if they don't know how to do those questions, they'll sit down at the test and and not be able to do it and end up with a a very poor grade on the final test anyway. Um, and so to a certain extent, I don't mind this as much, um, but it does kind of set some kids up, uh, does kind of set some kids up for failure along the way when they're doing this. And so I try to de-incentivize this as much as I can, um, but it's really very helpful for students to be able to have the same questions to be able to look at people's answers and figure out, oh, you did this wrong. I can see exactly what you're doing here. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mary, I quite frankly, I did the same sort of thing when I was in high school. I think it's 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 to a certain extent inevitable. Um, it's we we learn along the way that it really doesn't do the um, it really doesn't do us any favors um, after a while. And then there are a few things that I'm I'm doing um, with, with these homework things where, quite frankly, 
I, I've sort of hacked the um, the question in a form that is not really ideal, but it sort of works. Um, and so the uh, best example I have of this is a, a one of the things that people have to do is draw sort of the structure of a molecule out. It's called a Lewis structure, and there's no really good automated way to grade drawings in Moodle. I could do them all as um, uh, I, I could use Poodle and the math and the, the whiteboard piece in that and grade them by hand each time, but that really defeats the purpose of kind of having that immediate feedback for students. And so one of the um, one of the things that uh, that I've kind of yeah, what the thing that I've kind of come up with there is um, a really um, a really kind of hacky version of a drag and drop question where students have to drag the pieces of the um, of the Lewis structure into the spot on the diagram where it's supposed to be. And it works um, mostly well. Students figure out how to do it and they get a they get some feedback on how well they're doing and whether they're doing things right. But it's just really not quite it's really not quite good enough. Um, it works, and and so we, we continue on with it. It's the best that I have at this point. The benefits of having the immediate feedback certainly outweigh the the trickiness to a certain extent of having them have to do it that way, but it's not ideal. And then lastly is uh, just the time that it takes to do all of the feedback along the way and monitoring of all of the system. The good news from my perspective is that I've gotten nearly all of this set up at this point and can can keep reusing it from semester to semester. Um, and so it gets better and better every every year as I have time to sit down during the summer and go through the, the old data and figure out the mistakes and figure out what things are, um, where things are going. Um, but it just does take time to do. This is one of those things where I very much wish I was uh, collaborating with a whole group of chemistry teachers where we could all sort of do the same sort of thing along the way. Um, sadly, uh, it's just me. Um, the one thing that I really still want to implement that I um, haven't had the time to yet is a, a series of kind of random review quizzes along the way. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Shane. Um, yeah, the other thing I want to implement is kind of some random review quizzes along the way that are going to pull randomly from parts earlier in the course so that it reminds students kind of along the way of what they're doing. Um, so that by the time they hit the final exam, they've been practicing along the way in a rather sneaky little system. Um, but that's a that's a project for a summer at some point when I have a chance to set it all up. So uh, I, I pushed a little over the hour, um, uh, but if you have any if you have any questions that you um, would like to ask me, um, I'll go ahead and preemptively uh, cover one of them here. Um, I'm a chemistry teacher. I love uh, demonstrations and fire and whatnot, and so you know you can't put a chemistry teacher doing a presentation without them wanting to do a demonstration of some sort. And so this is the best I can offer you is a picture of me uh, lighting some uh, lycopodium powder on fire, which is a, it's a, it's actually a, the spores of a moss, uh, but it's really, really fine powder. And so you can, um, if you look closely at my right hand there, you'll see this this red thing in my hand, which is a powdered sugar shaker that I then shook over top of a Bunsen burner to get a big cloud of dust in the air. And then it eventually uh, caught in the Bunsen burner flame and you get a nice big arc of fire like that when you see it. Hey, that's actually not a bad idea. Sharing a lot. I, I wish we could get to do it, like sharing more and more of our, um, more and more of our things um, along the way. It's it, there's a lot of work that goes into all of this stuff and and kind of sharing it. Of course, the other piece with sharing it is that it's not always exactly what you're looking for, and sometimes you get you have to end up sifting through some of the quality of what other people are doing sometimes, and that sometimes takes more effort than just kind of doing it all yourself. Um, depends on kind of where you are and exactly what you're looking for on each of those sorts of things. Uh, 
Well, any 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 questions or thoughts? Y'all been uh, very great about popping stuff in the in the chat along the way. Uh, yeah, that's uh, I've been kind of unfortunately a lone ranger all of my academic career. My the first school that I taught at, I was literally the only chemistry teacher in the school district, um, and so I had absolutely no one to collaborate with um, other than electronically and that quite frankly doesn't work um, as quickly and easily sometimes as we would like or in sort of a consistent way you can't just kind of walk across the hall to someone and say hey you got a practice assignment that i can use on this particular topic it's a lot more um, you have to plan it a lot more to a certain extent. And so I've, I've been kind of a lone ranger my entire career. Um, and right now I'm the only honors chemistry teacher at my school. Um, the other chemistry teacher is, is teaching all of the regular classes. And so we use different assignments along the way to a certain extent as well. I'm glad you liked it, Harry. Um, I hope you uh, hope you'll check out the recording later, and and or feel free to ask questions about what you've um, what you've missed along the way too. Glad you glad you enjoyed it, Ali Reza. Did I say that correctly? I'll just, I'll just quickly jump in um, and just say uh, on behalf of the IMET team, thank you very much, Joshua. Um, enjoyed your presentation the first time, enjoyed it immensely the second time around as well. So um, thank you just for the inspiring ideas and everything. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, the, the teachers are, uh, we're, we're, a, we're a very practical lot. Um, and so that's why I really enjoy the, the, the teacher presentations as well too.